Yeah. People who ran games and people who were John Mattingly got one for you. I read him for a whole month. Everything else is by two and then it goes by five. so much yeah. 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 I got a few I was like barely Just below the 99. No, it doesn't Test! Test are not here! They stopped! They stalled out! Forward and forward! Forward and forward! Look at this Look at this! No key masters, but at least they know how to collect paper! Okay? Awesome! edition of AP United States History. Are we all peppy? <laughs> a good performance. So I'll have to see if someone YouTubed it so I can analyze uh, how, how much off I was on each. Uh, uh, I think I was a little better than I was a couple years ago. A uh, couple, couple years ago, I was precisely a beat behind. Uh, I, everybody was this way, I was that way. It, it, was, it was fairly beautiful. I think I, I, uh, I think I was only about a half step off this time. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I'm getting there. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. So uh, yeah. Pardon me? 
No, it was called. Yeah. It just was in my back pocket, and it made for comfortableness as I was sitting down on the desk. Yes. Oh, are you kidding? Are you kidding me? I think I, I, mine won't even update mine so old. Uh, yes. Okay. No, it's four. Uh, the, the, the original four. Okay. So, the original four. You know. Okay. So, um, anyway. So, um, we are now starting a new unit, and, okay, so, here's the thing, people. This is the last full unit of the fall semester. This is our last big test of the fall semester. So, if your grade is not quite where you want it to be, this is the time. Okay? This is the time. Um, we will also have, by the way, a, a notebook check, and in May, in the past I've done um, kind of a review test that was the, that they used in the honors class and the uh, regular class. If they, if they make up a good one for those classes, I may give it to y'all as a way of gaining points. All right, so it's, it's usually turned out pretty good. Um, for some reason, the AP kids do a little bit better on the test that's meant for the regular kids. I don't know why. Um, so, uh, but I will research that, see if we can find some last thing for you borderline people to claw your way to the top, okay? Um, anyway, but if you're looking for that good grade, this is the best unit to do it because it's awesome, okay? Uh, it's the causes and results of the Civil War, or as I'd like to think of it, the age of Lincoln, okay? So Lincoln, now don't 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 let size be the issue here. Okay, um, uh, it's just as important as the Jefferson statue, because um, he was. I got him at the birthplace of Abraham Lincoln in Kentucky. Okay, so this is this is a this is a bust of Lincoln straight out of Kentucky. Okay, so he's going to watch over us here during this year. Okay. And um, in this unit, basically we're going to talk about the causes of, of the Civil War, um, uh, kind of why this thing's going to happen. We'll talk briefly kind of about the war itself, and then the war, and then the, uh, um, what happens because of it. Okay? It, and it's really cool things. So, we start off on, it basically, if, you, if we do it as causes the war and results, it just so happens that the chapters go uh, 13 causes, uh, 14 the war, 15 the results. Okay, it divides itself up very neatly. Um, the, um, the weight, I, I would say as far as where, if you were studying, would go into the, the, the cause and results thing. And um, as far as the war itself, I will give you the things you really need to know. There's a couple of really important during the war, uh, and I will highlight them. Um, anyway, so we start off with the causes part. And with ca um, when we start off with causes, um, the thing that really is going to um, help divide the United States, ironically, is the expansion of the United States. That expansion led to division. And, and, and the reason for this being the issue, that expansion led to division, is on the issue of slavery, what became the thing, that line in the sand, the thing that we're absolutely not going to uh, let happen anymore, is let there be more slavery. So what, uh, basically what kind of happens as far as the anti-slavery movement is it kind of got to the point, okay, slavery where it is, we're not gonna be able to fix that. We can say no more slavery. And that no more slavery thing is what is going to cause that ultimate division. The, the ultimate civil war. Anyway, so the war, Okay, on the, or the Civil War, uh, largely caused by the issue of expansion. In this section, we're also going to talk about a war for expansion, the, uh, the Mexican-American War. 
and how that creates a sectional crisis, or that line in the sand. We begin with the idea of manifest destiny. And so I'm going to throw at you a couple quotes to see if you can kind of get what this thing means. First comes from uh, the, uh, um, the uh, um, Democratic Convention of all, of all places, New Jersey. In New Jersey, they're going to say, line it up, line it up, make way for the young American <coughs> buffalo. He has not yet lined it up. And what they were talking about was that way back in um, 1803, Thomas Jefferson had done this uh, huge purchase, right? He added all of this territory to the United States. And when Thomas Jefferson added it, it had taken about, uh, it had taken the United States about almost 300 years to kind of fill up, um, meaning colonies through the United States. It taken almost like 300 years for the, for the United States to kind of fill up that land going up to the Mississippi River. And so Thomas Jefferson added like another third. So obviously it's gonna take like another 300 years for us to fill that. We missed it, oh, by so very little. Okay, he thought it would take 300 years, it took, well, 30. Um, just, you know, what's 270 years among friends? Um, basically, most of the really good land of the Louisiana Purchase was kind of taken by the 1840s. And so, what they're talking about in New Jersey is that we need more. The other quote I want you to look at is one that is written in a kind of a newspaper magazine thing that was known as United States Magazine and Democratic Review. And the, one of the editor writers for United States Magazine and, De and Democratic Review is a guy by the name of John L. O'Sullivan. And what John L. O'Sullivan will say, it is our manifest destiny to overspread the continent, the continent allotted by providence for the free development of our multiplying millions. Manifest destiny. This is where we believe the phrase had been coined. And so now, look at those terms or those passages. What I want you to do real quick is yeah, kind of analyze these things. What do they mean? Write into your notebook. Okay. What, what do you think? That, what are they trying to say here? And, you know, not, uh, um, look at some of the words. Look at the words like manifest, destiny, providence, millions. Okay. What are they trying to say? Finish that sentence you're writing. So I've, ha I've, I've been having trouble uh, randomly selecting people to call on, so I downloaded a, a random number. <laughs> okay, so 
I gave everybody a number, and I've got the random number generator that will generate me a random number from 1 to 38. So, randomly genera generated, we have number 22, which is... Caleb? What do you think this means? Be, uh, that make millions be at the top. Okay, so let's see. Let, let's see if we, we can get a few more thoughts here. Randomly generated number twenty. Caitlin C. Caitlin with a C. I think it means that the American population is destined to spread and spread and spread until it goes over and the continent Okay, spread and spread and spread. Okay. One more randomly selected person, number 11. Taylor. Yeah, I'm just starting to write it because I was writing the whole quote, but okay. I think it's like um, they want to just gain all this land and just keep expanding, but it's going to be overwhelming. So, so, yeah, I think you guys kind of got it. But let's go roll, one more time with the two words <laughs> manifest. When something <coughs> manifests itself, what, what is it doing? It manifests itself. Something manifests itself in front of you. What, uh, what, what, is, what, what has happened here? It appears. And when it appears, is it kind of like uh, whatever up here? Or is it a, yeah, okay. It's a manifest, okay, okay. You're not missing this thing. Whoa, manifest and destined. Okay, look, it is your destiny. Um, what, uh, uh, it, it, it was the destiny of Anakin Skywalker to kill the Emperor. Um, uh, what, 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 is, what, is, what is destiny? Okay, what is destiny? It's something that you're supposed to do in the future. It's basically what your life is leading up to. It's what your life is leading up to. So, the life of the, it is obvious that the life of the United States it's destiny. This to do what? You just said it. Yeah. <coughs> coast to coast. Okay. All the way to the west coast, which is the best coast. All right. So, uh, so, so we got this. So, this, so you, you kind of get this key. All right. So. So. When we look at the idea of manifest destiny, however, there's almost like there were two versions of it, okay? There's two interpretations of it. Both are the same as far as, are we taking over land? A duh, of course we are. Okay, both of them believe that, that, that it is the destiny of the United States over so respect the continent, got it? But, what shall we do when we get there? There's a northern version that says, Let's farm. Let's plant our crops. We'll become free farmers. Okay, we'll vote a little bit. It's awesome. That's manifest destiny. Now, if there's some people in the way, well, they'll have to be removed, killed maybe. But, you know, hey, we'll farm it. Then there is the southern version. Cotton. <laughs> Money. Cotton. Money. Cotton money. All right, and so so you know they're both. If you're in our way, well you got gotta be moved or something. <laughs> but what way are you doing it? Okay, uh, is it for more land to grow more cotton, or is it for farmers to farm their land? Got it. A northern and a southern version. Now the ultimate destination is the Pacific Ocean. The ultimate destination is the Pacific Ocean. And early on, in the early 1840s, the thing that we start that kind of uh, tickles our fancy is Oregon. Okay? Now, in 1818, the United States made a deal 
with the British. And in that deal, the United States and, and, and Britain basically say, hey Britain, your claim on the Oregon Territory is awesome! Don't you want to say something about our claim? And Britain says, well, your claim on the Oregon Territory is awesome too! Let's share! And so since 1818, the United States and Great Britain share the governance of the Oregon Territory. Now during that time, the British had largely um, been engaging in the fur business. Uh, uh, if you were an otter living uh, in the Northwest Territories uh, uh, of, uh, of Oregon, right, you were sad <laughs> because they were killing uh, otter by the droves. The United States, though a little bit into that, uh, in, into that fur trading business, was not as interested in Oregon until about the 1840s. In the 1840s, the United States Navy is going to look at um, Puget Sound. When, when I was a senior in high school, I got a recruitment letter from uh, the University of Puget Sound. How does the University of Puget Sound? Um, anyway, so um, what the United States Navy thought is that this would be an awesome port for the United States to engage in trade with Asia. And so we start looking at, wow, Maybe we are a Western-facing nation. Maybe we're a nation that needs to trade with the East or the Far East. And wouldn't a great place to have that, that trade base? Puget Sound. The other thing that became interesting to Americans in the 1840s was a place called the Willamette Valley. In the Willamette Valley, the soil. Oh my God. You look at the soil in the, in, in, in the Willamette Valley and it like grows things. It's like the most amazing soil ever. And so thousands and thousands of particularly people from uh, more of the North, Old Northwest Territory are moving down the Oregon Trail, you can play the game, uh, to Oregon. So the United States starts to think, should we be sharing Oregon? Or wouldn't it be better if we owned it all? Our Oregon, not British or ours. And so this attitude manifests destiny, that this is gonna be ours, of course it's gonna be ours, becomes huge in the 1840s. Now, there's another thing that will pop up on our radar later, but let's talk about it now. California. And California was at that part, at that time, part of Mexico, northern Mexico, Alta, Alta California. And um, not as many people were moving to California at that time. Uh, the, uh, the Willamette Valley was a great farming thing. It seemed to be taking up that excess population of Americans that are moving westward. And so the few people who actually did emigrate into Mexico were hugely outnumbered by the Mexican Californians, okay, the, the Alta Californians. Finally, our last thing about this, this thing, uh, about getting to the Pacific. You were leaving, usually, from here. And you would be going to here. But in order to go from here to here, you had to go through the Great Plains. Now the Great Plains had been designated by President Bloody Bloody Andrew Action Jackson, AKA Old Hickory, as permanent American Indian territory. Permanent territory for, for American Indians for as long as the grass grow and the rivers flow. 
for as long as the grass grow and the rivers flow, this land would be land for the American Indians. But there's a problem here. If we are trying to get through this territory, what's the likelihood we're absolutely going to leave it alone? It is pretty much zero. So, we should know that there are going to be people that are in the way. Now the big group, the major group that was in the way of American expansion, in this area in between, were the Lakota Sioux. Now the Lakota Sioux had become the dominant uh, American <coughs> Indian nation on the Great Plains due to something that was actually the Europeans. When the um, Spanish and the French first started settling um, the, the center part of, the, uh, of what becomes the United States, they brought with them all their nasty diseases and it killed off most of the people that were living there. The one group that survived this, this uh, huge genocide was the Sioux because the Sioux lived in uh, nomadic groups, not in big uh, big populated areas. And so when these epidemics hit, they survived. So now, one more time. Basically what I'm setting up for you here is the prize getting to the coast. The first object of desire, Oregon, the second object of our desire, eventual object of our divide, desire, California. And the two things that are in the way. A, California is owned by Mexico. And B, to get to these places, you had to travel through permanent American Indian territory, which is probably going to make permanent American Indian territory not permanent American Indian territory. Got it? All right. So, so does everyone get kind of the setup here? All right. So things shift in the United States in 1844. 1844 is a huge, huge year for kind of the change in American policies as far as expansion. In 1844, the fact that we were interested in Oregon made it so that American interest in Texas kind of returns. Now remember, Texas had become independent in 1836. And in 1836, uh, Texas was basically going, take us, annex us. But the United States didn't. Martin Van Buren had said no to annexation because he thought it would lead to a sectional divide, a sectional conflict. But now, think about it. Oregon, what section would be most interested in Oregon? Which, which team? South team, North team? North team. North team. Okay? Not very good cotton growing land. Uh, uh, cotton doesn't like a lot of tons of rainfall all the time, all the, all the, all the time which you get in Oregon. So, if the North team is getting Oregon, well guess what South team wants? Hey, look, they're getting, oh, no, we want Texas, right? I mean, it's only fair, okay? If North team is getting Oregon, we should get Texas. So now all of a sudden, Texas is on the table. Now, second factor, why Texas kind of reappears on our radar in 1844 is that Britain is going to basically it's kind of be it's going to kind of get out there kind of known it's kind of rumor that Britain was liking the fact that Texas was independent. Anyone think here? Think, think for a moment. Chew on it for a moment. Why do you think Britain is going to be so happy about Texas staying independent? Yeah, why? Yeah, so remember that Texas believed that the territory of Texas went all the way to the Rio Grande. Think of all this territory as possible, probable cotton growing land. And if they're starting to grow all that cotton, 
what possibly happens to the United States as the dominant cotton growing player? Two thirds of the world's cotton uh, it, it was grown in the United States in, until the 1840s. So if, if Texas became the, it stayed an independent country and, and, and grew to its huge abilities, are they going to be a competitor as far as cotton is concerned? Is Britain happy about that? How's the United States feeling about that? Here. So, the fact that Britain is interested in Texas remaining independent, the fact that now we're not so interested in remaining independent, and the fact that Oregon is going to be kind of this free growth area, uh, then obviously Texas should be back on the table. So it's 1844. It's an election year. Does anyone remember who was president in 18, uh, uh, 1841 through 1845? Uh, who does anyone know who that, person, who that who is that president? Tyler. It's Tyler. Okay, the man who was out of his party. Okay, so President Tyler, he's kicked out of the Whig party. But guess what he had learned in the last four years? I like being president. <laughs> I want to stay president. But here's the problem. He has no party. Is it going to be easy to get re-elected president if you were a president without a party? No. Are the Whigs loving him these days? Absolutely not. So, you're Tyler. You're going, wait, how can I stay president? And so who's he going to start making goo-goo lines at? <coughs> okay. Oh, Democrats. <coughs> Yoo-hoo. Tyler here. I want to stay president, and as president, you know what I will do? I will say, America should have all of Oregon, and America should have Texas, too. So basically, he's offering both sections. Uh, Southern Democrats, okay, Texas. Northern Democrats, Oregon. It's like a, it's like a fisherman with lures, you know. Tzz. Come on, Northern Democrats. Tzz. Come on, Southern Democrats. He's trying to reel these groups in. Now, to kind of prove its faithfulness, he's going to send a treaty of annexation of Texas to the Senate. But when it gets into the Senate, it runs into a buzzsaw. First of all, Senator Henry Clay, a Whig, is against it. And he basically pulls the Whig votes off the table, making it difficult for, for, uh, on, for Tyler to get this done. Additionally, former President Martin Van Buren is going to be talking to some of the northern uh, Democrats. And he's going to say, I don't think you should ought to do this right now. It might lead to division in America. So with former President Martin Van Buren against it, with current Senator Henry Clay against it, this fails in the Senate. Tyler is not able to prove that he can get it done. So, how's your trust, how, how's, your, how's your level? Do you, you, uh, even the Democrats, are you loving this guy? Is he doing it for you? Is he, is he, is he your guy? So, in the election, the Democrats are not going for Tyler. They don't trust him. Not only did he fail to get Texas, but he had taken the independent treasury that Martin Van Buren had created, and he had um, destroyed it. He had, uh, the Whigs had pushed through a bill, and he had signed a bill ending the independent treasury. They don't like this guy. So now, who's going to be your candidate? Well, there were three heavy hitters that were out there looking to become president of the United States. One was the uh, um, was uh, um, a guy by the name of Martin Van Buren, who we already know. Martin Van Buren wants to return to the White House. He wants another shot at it. And so what he's going to do is he's going to go off to uh, um, former President Jackson on bended knee, and he's going to say to President and former President Jackson, will you bless my candidacy? 
And Jackson says yes, but his yes is not unconditional. He says, on the condition, yes, I, you may run for president, I will back you. If you place my guy, James K. Polk, on the ballot as your vice president. Okay? And James K. Polk, his nickname, Young Hickory, to Jackson's old Hickory. He's kind of his protege. Well, Martin Van Buren says yes to the deal. Well, the other candidates were a guy by the name of James Buchanan from uh, Pennsylvania, and a guy by the name of Louis Cass from Michigan. And um, they're, they're basically possibly going to, uh, they're, they're all kind of buying for the pres uh, presidency, they're all going to go against each other again in, in, in the Democratic Convention. But before the convention, Martin Van Buren makes two big errors. Big error number one, he blocks, or works to block, the annexation of Texas. So how are Southern Democrats now thinking about Martin Van Buren? Is he, are they loving him or not loving him? Two. James K. Polk was running for governor of Tennessee, and he loses. Martin Van Buren goes, man, this guy's useless, and he can't even win his own state. I shouldn't put him on my own, on my ticket. So he kicks him off the ticket. Well now, not only is he 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 pissed off the South, who else is he pissed off? Jackson. Jackson. So James K. Polk goes running down to Nashville. Boo hoo. Boo hoo. I got kicked off the ticket. I didn't get to be governor. Wham, wham. Jackson says to him, don't you worry, I have a scheme. And basically what they do is they approach members of the, of the voting groups at the convention that were favoring the three different candidates. And they go to like the Buchanan people and they say, I know James Buchanan's your guy, I respect that. And you, you, you stick with him. But should it become apparent that your guy cannot win, would you pick James K. Polk as a second choice? Andy Jackson will be eternally great. So all you have to do is say, my backup plan is James K. Polk. You can stick with Buchanan as your guy. Is it a deal? He then goes to the cast people. He says to the cast people, hey, if, okay, your guy should not be able to win if the, if the, if the convention's at a deadlock, and your guy cannot be the candidate, would you be willing to go with James K. Polk as your second choice? Andy Jackson will love you for it. To get that Andy Jackson blessing, golden. So they agree. They then go to the Martin Van Buren people who have, uh, who have basically, now they're really hurting, right? They make the same deal. So it goes to the convention. And at the convention, a rule is passed. In order to get the nomination, you will need a two-thirds vote. How easy is it going to be to get a two-thirds vote for your candidate if there's three different people who are vying for the election? Extraordinary. And so at the convention, they vote, it's split three ways. They vote again, it's split three ways. They vote again, it's split three ways. Finally, on about the ninth ballot, the Jackson supporters, the Jacksonian team, says, what about James K. Polk? And the people who made their pledges start to say, James K. Polk. And then on the 10th ballot, James K. Polk nearly has enough votes to become the candidate. And on the 11th ballot, somebody says, For party unity, let's make it unanimous. James K. Polk. <coughs> and the Democratic Party, standing on their feet, clapping, says, yes, James K. Polk. And they unanimously nominate James K. Polk 
and then they turn to their next door neighbor and say, who the hell is James K. Polk? <laughs> he was a governor from Tennessee. He had been Speaker of the House, but he did not have a name-popping repu uh, reputation. But deals had been made. Yeah. So this will make James K. Polk the first what we call dark horse candidate for the Democratic Party. What a dark horse is, is somebody who comes out of nowhere to get a nomination or win an election. The, um, if you had gone into the Democratic Convention and you had said, I predict we are going to nominate James K. Polk, okay? You're lying. Nobody was predicting that it was going to be James K. Polk. Polk. Oh, I know, I know, I know. Bad teacher. Ah, double bad. Wow. I went double bad. Okay. Try that one more time. Okay. That is cool. Polk is favored by Andy Jackson in what we call the manifest destiny side of the Democratic Party. Polk immediately makes a pledge. He says he is going to reoccupy Oregon and re-annex Texas. Basically what he is doing here is a little bit of revisionist history. You see, what the Democrats are claiming is that Oregon has always been the property of the United States. And that Texas doesn't need to be annexed because it was, again, already part of the United States. It was part of the Louisiana Territory, so therefore it was already ours. It's completely ignoring the fact that the United States gave up its claims on uh, Texas, and that the United States had, um, had split the Oregon Territory. They're basically saying, it's ours because of course it is. To symbolize how powerfully he was for taking all of the Oregon Territory, James K. Polk will, will, will call out a slogan, 54-40 or fight. Now what this was, is that if you look at the coordinates of the southern boundary of Alaska, way up here, okay, that was at 5440 North Latitude. And basically what he's saying is that Britain, hey, if you don't think this is ours, we'll fight you for it, okay? 5440 or fight all of Oregon or we'll fight in Britain for it. Okay, so does this guy sound aggressive? Does this guy sound like he's gonna like he's gonna take everything? Well, that's the attitude he's trying to prevent, uh, uh, portray. He's trying to show I am manifest destiny. All of America, all of North America, is practically ours already. Get it? Yeah. You remember your question? Yeah. Wait, is the Whig Party still? We're about to talk about the Whig Party. Okay. Okay, we're good? Okay. Meanwhile, the Whigs will nominate Henry Clay. This will be Henry Clay's third shot. Okay. And when he gets the nomination, all of a sudden he gets all nervous about a stand that he had taken. He had taken a stand against the annexation of Texas. Now he's afraid that if he continues to say he is against the annexation of Texas, Southern Whigs will not vote for him. So he flip-flops. He now says, Yes, I am in favor of annexation on. Okay. Maybe I was too loud. Clay's 
play. Huh? You can't lock it. You can't lock it. Yes, you're stuck here forever. <laughs> 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 nice try. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Henry Clay. Henry Clay has basically now reversed his view on taxes thinking that if he doesn't say he's in favor of annexation, Southern Whigs will not vote for him. The problem is, is it backfires. Because in this election, there will be a third party. They were known as the Liberty Party. Oh, he's working on the, uh, on the, um, there's a fuse box right there that the, my door is in the way. Of. Sure. That, that, that. Thank you. We're all good? Yeah, we're all good. We're all good? We're good? Okay. So, Clay flip flops on the issue of taxes. And it backfires. You see, in this election, there will be a third party running known as the Liberty Party. We met these people before. Remember when we talked about um, William, uh, William Lloyd Garrison? And William Lloyd Garrison was this big radical anti-slavery guy, thought that basically we should end slavery without com uh, any sort of compensation. And there was this group that broke off from uh, William Lloyd Garrison, basically thought that politics was the answer to the slavery part, uh, problem, and they formed a political party. Well, this is that political party. And so in 1844, they're going to run this guy by the name of James Bernie, who's basically going to go into this election issue, issue focused. We are against the annexation of Texas on anti-slavery grounds. Slavery is wrong. We are not in favor of annexation. Well, now, Northern Whigs, known as conscience Whigs, they are against slavery on, on, on just that it is wrong. Conscience, conscience Whigs, anti-slavery. They decide they cannot trust Clay on the slavery issue. And so they do a protest vote of James Bernie. The third parties, what do they do? They don't win. But they do prevent other people from winning. And so what happens is that enough um, northern Whigs, particularly in New York State, will vote in favor of Barony instead of Clay, taking enough votes from Clay to make James K. Paul president of the United States. Clay is now America's biggest loser. The Democrats will take a look at the results of the election, and they will declare that this is a mandate. A mandate in favor of manifest destiny and the annexation of Texas. But they have a problem. The problem is they did not have a two-thirds majority in the Senate. And why is that a problem? 
to vote in favor of a treaty. To approve a treaty in the United States Constitution, it says you must have a two-thirds vote in the Senate. Problem. They, can't act. they cannot do it by treaty. So, now let's all think here for a moment. Let's say you really want to do something and the rules seem to say you can't do it. What do you do? You do it anyway. Maybe you do it anyway, but how? Who says change the rules? You change the rules. You pull what James T. Kirk would call a Kobayashi Maru. Okay. You change the rules of the game, okay, to make it so that you can win. What the Democrats do is they point, they pass a joint resolution. This only requires a bare majority. And what the, uh, what the joint resolution will do is instead of being a treaty of, annexa of annexation, it's a resolution of, in, of invitation. Basically, it says, hello, Texas, would you like to join our union? And Texas, who's been sitting there since 1836, going, take me. Of course, what do they say? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now, by the way, some people in Texas today believe that this gives Texas a special superpower that nobody, no other state has. That because they had joined the Union voluntarily this way, via invitation, that they could voluntarily leave. Okay? So this is what some people in Texas believe. Now, by the way, uh, Texas once before tried to leave the Union, and some guy named Abraham Lincoln said, no, you can't do that, and, well, they're back. Okay? Texas is? So I was there two weeks ago. It's in Dallas. It's such a weird place. How is it a weird place? Nothing makes sense. Like, all the roads are so, so weird. They're so weird. Like, on the road. Well, just Texas. Everything's big. Texas. <laughs> anyway, okay, wait, wait, wait. It's weird. Let's just go on. <laughs> anyway, so Texas joins the Union as uh, the 28th state and the 15th slave state. of the notes is going to be taught to you by song. Okay? All right? Um, I, I will put up some kind of, most of what is written here in the song lyrics are actually completely uh, the facts. My, uh, from what I hear here, uh, this band, they might be giants wrote this song simply by opening up an encyclopedia and taking the encyclopedia entry under James K. Paul and turning, a song, turning it into a song, okay? So uh, it, for the most part, is accurate. So I will put up a couple things uh, during the song that I want you to get down. But pretty much, this is the story, okay? So, this is a handout that should go into your notebook as actual notes. Okay? This handout should go into your notebook as actual notes. This handout should go into your notebook as, as actual notes. 
This handout should go into your notebook as actual notes. Now you guys actually did have your stance. All right. So, so ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, they might be giants. minutes left. Come on, you can see that. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So, so just kind of on to highlight here. The first point I'm putting down to give you personality. James K. Polk wins the election. And who did he win it because of? Well, who got him there? Who is who, who is the all point? Andy Jackson, right? Well, Andy Jackson will then hand to James K. Polk a list of people who Andy Jackson wanted appointed to certain jobs. Spoil system, right? James K. Polk says, no thank you. Who's president now? Polk. Polk going to make his own list. 
Pope is going to appoint his own people. He's in charge now. Does that give you a little bit of a, a picture of his personality here? Okay. Next, as president, he's going to say, I want to do four things. And if I can do them all in one term, I will not run again. And working, basically, he was someone who uh, got up at 6 and he worked until about uh, 8, 9 o'clock at night, every night. Straight through. Every day. He will work himself into his grave. Okay. Um, he does get everything done. He does only run, uh, he does not uh, run for a second term. And it's a good thing because three months out of being president, he dies. Yeah. Who is the vice president? Um, who is the vice president? Um, Dallas. But he didn't die in office. Okay. Anyway, so um, he is going to. The things we're going to concentrate here is Choir California and settle the Oregon question. Um, so the last thing I want you to kind of get about him is that while he's president, we have a booming economy. We're on the upside of the economic cycle, the good side of the economic cycle. Got it? All right. So here is James K. Polk. Now, I know this is kind of old school for y'all, but um, if I were choosing who's going to play him in the movie, I choose a young Sean Connery. Hook, James Hook. No bond with people here. Okay. Um, all right, we're good? Okay. Anyway, so, um, so let's go with the, the manifest destiny thing of the Oregon Territory. Now, here's the thing. Hook is a Southern Democrat. And what had already been done before he even becomes president? What, 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 what had already been added to the Union? Texas. So, Southern Democrats, did they get the big thing they wanted? Yeah. Now, Oregon, let's think about that. What type of states are you going to uh, create, most likely out of rainy, rainy Oregon? Wait, what type of states? Free or, or slave? Free. Guess what? Southern Democrats were less fired up about taking all of Oregon now that the election is over and we already have taxes. Gee, I wonder why. They already got their thing, Texas, and now think of Oregon Territory all the way up to the southern border of Alaska. How many free states could that make? A lot. <coughs> Are you so fired up? Do you want that many possible free, slave state, uh, free states entering the Union? The answer is no. Polk also is finding that in order to get California, it was likely going to lead to war. And so here you're thinking, do we, the United States, want to have to fight both Britain and Mexico at the same time? Would that be the best possible action? The answer is kind of obviously no. Meanwhile, the British, A, they don't want war with the United States. B, they actually had not even really moved into the Oregon Territory. And they basically killed all the other. <laughs> they, they, uh, there, there is barely any otter left. They killed them all. So what good is it? It's not as valuable anymore to them. And so you have the President of the United States less inclined to wanting all of the Oregon Territory. You have the British not caring so much about the southern part of the Oregon Territory where the Columbia River is because the otter are dead. Gee, I wonder if we can make a deal. Now, it just so happens, way back in 1818, 
We had made a deal regarding the Louisiana Territory where we had drawn a line at 49 degrees across the top of the Louisiana Territory. Just so happens that if you continued that line, 49 degrees, it splits the Oregon Territory almost perfectly in half. Go figure. And so, the British and the Americans agree that 49 is just fine. 49 is just fine. We split it. Now, by the way, there was a couple little things that had to be worked out. A, Vancouver Island touches down below 49 degrees. <coughs> we say to the British, you can have that whole island. You know, it's named after your guy anyway. The British then say, well, we want the islands that are now below Victoria Island. Those, those are kind of in the same chain. We should get them too. The Americans, they wanted um, Puget Sound as a port. And these islands are right there at the mouth of Puget Sound. Do we want them to have islands right in the mouth of our harbor? No. No. So what we do is we make the British, we say what sounds like a, a, a game of chance. We tell them, OK, about those islands. Here's what we'll do. We're going to toss a barrel into the ocean, right in the middle of the islands. And if the barrel floats north, Britain gets the, the islands. And if the barrel floats south, the United States gets the islands. Guess who had been doing their, uh, their uh, climatology homework before this meeting? We knew exactly which way that barrel was going to float. <laughs> so the barrel, whoa, we floated south. Thank you. Thank you for playing. <laughs> okay. It pays to have the smart people on your team. Okay. So now, ladies and gentlemen, Okay, so now, ladies and gentlemen, California. Now, California is going to be a little bit more difficult because if you're going to try and make a negotiation to get something, shouldn't you ought to be talking to the person you're negotiating with? Yeah, it's kind of a thing. The problem is, Mexico's not talking to us. They're angry because we had annexed Texas. They kind of thought Texas was theirs, and us annexing it made them angry. Meanwhile, we weren't talking so much to them because it, they owed us about $3.3 million. Okay? So both teams are going, you took Texas. Well, you owe us three, you owe us money. Okay? And so the, the, there's not good communication going on. Now, there's a second issue that if they were talking, they would argue over the border <coughs> of Texas. You see, Mexico believed that Texas was only about this big, okay? They believed that Texas ended at the Nueces River, which was the historic boundary of the province when it had been part of Mexico. Well, the United States said, well, guess what? We're going with the Treaty of Velasco. And in that treaty, which was signed by Santa Ana, border of Texas goes all the way to here, okay? So this is what the United States thinks Texas is, like Texas on steroids. <laughs> this is what, uh, uh, what Mexico believes uh, Texas is, which is what sometimes happens to parts of your body when you take steroids, okay? Anyway, okay, anyway. So since we're not talking so much, okay, Hulk is going to start doing some behind the scenes action. The first thing he does is he starts sending messages to uh, 
on the Californios, okay, the, the Mexican Californians, and saying, hey, don't you want to form your own country and then get annexed by the United States? It would be so cool. Secondly, he's going to send the United States Navy to right off the coast of California, basically staring at San Francisco Bay. And basically, if you get the signal we're at war, take San Francisco. Thirdly, he sends an American uh, unit under the command of John C. Fremont on an exploratory mission. They're going to go explore the Sierra Nevada Mountains. But guess what? Sierra Nevada Mountains are in Mexico. So we're basically sending an army into Mexico to explore Mexico. Why is that army actually there? To be positioned, pre-positioned pre in case of war. Finally, Hulk sends John Slidell down into Mexico with 25 million bucks. And his job is to go, hello Mexico, $25 million for California, and lens east of it. Come on, you know, $25 million. You'll be able to pay off your debts to us and everything. He arrives in Mexico. They won't even talk to him. They won't even officially receive him. They won't take his offer. They slam the door. So what's a poor president to do? So James K. Polk now will send a general by the name of Zachary Taylor. Zachary Taylor is sent to patrol American territory between the Nueces and the Rio Grande River party. Okay? This territory down here. <coughs> To Mexico, where is Zachary Taylor? If he is between the Nueces River, which was what Mexico believed the boundary was, and the Rio Grande River, which what the United States believes the border is, where is Zachary Taylor? In Mexico. He's in Mexico. And so basically, he's running up and down the Rio Grande River going, hello, Mexico! I'm in America! Look at me! I'm in America! Hello! Did I mention the fact that here I am in America? Okay. And so, what's the, what are they trying to do here? Yeah. So, th this is kind of what we'll, we'll call the Dean Loftus principle. Okay. Um, if you get pulled into Dean Loftus' office for fighting, what do you want to be able to say? I, do it. I started it! It was me! I was just defending myself! Them! It was them! Right? Okay. Don't blame me, blame them. The United States is basically trying to say Mexico would start the war. This is the territory which was in dispute. This is where uh, Zachary Taylor will be running up and down the border. Hey, seniors. This is an announcement regarding Senior Poll. Yearbook will be posting a Google Drive link on both the Facebook and Schoology Senior pages this weekend. You will have until next Friday, the 31st, to nominate your fellow seniors for the various categories. Keep an eye out for the link because this year's senior poll nominations will be done online. Read the instructions carefully and be sure to vote. Thank you. When next we meet. A guy by the name of Ulysses Grant will say, that the reason why Zachary Taylor was right there on the Rio Grande River is we are there to provoke a fight. Next time, we talk about that fight. I'm <laughs> <laughs>
Another good one. It's, but look at what, but, but like look at it. Is, I know, but it's 41. Okay, which, what percentage is that out of 55? Is that close to 87? So I guess if I'm at 87 in the class, I got just about 87, so now I'm stuck at So that's why you didn't move. Right. You have an 87, you got an 87, that's 87. Right. So I just have to get higher than 87. You have to get up. That in order to move up, you've got to get better. You have to get better. You have to ace this. So those, uh, and those essays, I'll get them done as soon as uh, well, when. Eight. Eight. I, I know, I know. you know, uh, okay. but you've got to, be, to make any sort of case at all. It's got not even an A minus. It's got to be the solid ninety-four to really make it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But you can read them. Yeah, I've like done all the essays. Yeah, I know. And so, if you've done all those things, you're the, you're the person that you're doing something, you're more likely to say you're helped than something you've done. Okay? So get, in, so get into the A9 something zone. It would mean that you've made a really good piece. Are you okay with me? Yeah. You do have to do it. Yeah. I, don't we all? But, but I think, I think I think you can do this. Like someone just wants to say. Good day. I wanted to say I think you would be Justin Timberlake. I could do that. Yeah. I think you would be. That well, no, that's what I'm going for. His his hair is how my hair used to be back before it started turning this other color because I had children. I'm blaming them because before then I had dark hair. Now I don't. So it's their fault. We'll, we'll pretend we won't talk about the 11 years that have passed in that time. It's probably the best thing just because of that. Again, we, 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 do we pull it? Do we pull it off? I mean, uh, I thought that I, I, I thought that things were pretty good. I still don't like, and I don't know how it can be fixed. But the freshmen and sophomores sitting over yeah. there with everybody with, with I mean, their back. They, they could barely hear it too. Yeah, the speaker kept going on and off. I mean, it was, it, 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 it was pretty sad. Yeah. But uh, for the juniors and seniors, it was awesome. Yeah. So, uh, I was like, hey, you were juniors and seniors. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Have a good weekend. You too. Great job, Taylor. <laughs>